So let's go back. So planning, design, construction, operations, customer. Focus on the customer, people and products. We have to focus on what's inside the vehicle, right? What do we talk about in uh, uh, vehicles today? Uh, let's use engineering, right? So why do we have 12-foot lanes? Do we need 12-foot lanes, technically? Why? Some people can't stay in them. Exactly, right? It's a comfort thing. The vehicles typically are not, unless, you know, I'm not trying to say they're not oversized, overweight vehicles, and stuff like that, but typically, the vehicles are not 12 feet wide, right? It's a comfort. We, you know, I need space. I don't want to be crowded. I need some space, right? Uh, most of our standards are very empirical, right? So the one I like to talk about is 1,400 vehicles per lane per hour, essentially, on a, you know, uh, interstate four-lane system. That's what we consider capacity. Why? Right? I, I think it's actually more. It's actually about 2,000, 2,200. It's technically what, but we factor it down, right? Because of how we drive, right? <laughs> right? So one of the there's a a uh, a study that was done, and they had so some of the engineering people may have seen this, or planners may have seen this too. They have uh, like six vehicles driving a circle, right? Fairly large circle. Everybody said, drive 25 miles an hour. Just keep your distance and drive around. How long do you think it lasts before all of a sudden he's going, ooh, stop, slow, you know, they all sort of crowd up and, and they're in this constant little back and forth traffic jam and not even close to going to 25, right? Not long, right? It has to do with us as drivers, right? Um, even with cruise control, I like to say, we can't keep a constant speed, right? Um, and so uh, that is going to change very clearly. Um, we can obviously move a lot more vehicles. If we're not driving, the vehicle's driving, it's controlling that, the capacity is significantly more in the system that we have today, very clearly, and safer. Absolutely, right? That's a big change, very clearly, for us on the horizon. Okay. People and partnership, right? Does the future of transportation require new skills? No? Everyone says yes, pretty sure? Yep, there's change happening, right? We, we definitely need different skill sets in the future. We need to grow ourselves, right, with new skill sets. There's no question about that, right? New partnerships. Right? There are so many non-traditional companies working in and around our business, I think we have to form new partnerships. Right? We typically have partnerships, right? I'm not trying to say they're not good, AGC, right? counties, cities, sort of the traditional federal government. Right? I believe we have to develop new partnerships with entities that are working in and around transportation, pushing the technology in that sense, so that we get a better understanding. One of them I'm going to talk a little bit about is mapping in a short period. Does it pose budget challenges? Program? A little bit, right? We're going to do mobility as a service. So where does uh, most of our funding come from today? Fuel, right? Specifically the type of fuel, right? And then what's required when we get that funding? Can I go spend it on ocean ports? No, it has to go back in specifically towards that uh, system or product where it came from. How does that enable mobility by, as a service? Probably has a few constraints to it, for sure, right? Yeah. Does it change our operations budget? Yeah, absolutely, All right? I think it has effect on that. Delivery systems. Do our delivery systems need to be different in the future? My answer is yes. Communication systems. Process improvement. For sure, our process improvement will be much different. Right? New standards, as I talked about, engineering side. Are there going to be emerging tasks that we just haven't even gotten a handle on yet? The answer is yes. Right. A lot of change. This last one is the one I really want to talk about. Risk. Advantageous. 
What are most organizations today? Risk what? Adverse, right? That's pretty, pretty counterintuitive, right? Pretty counter to what we talk about. There's a lot of discussion, especially nationally, about risk. We've got to manage risk, you know, the, the negative connotation to risk. Good God, you know. Make sure that we're managing that risk so that it doesn't bite you, you know, and cause all kinds of problems on your project. Don't necessarily disagree with that, but we have to be risk advantageous. We actually have to be the opposite. Uh, enable that. There's a way to manage it, but you have to be risk advantageous. Very, very important, I think, for us as we think about transportation in the future. Right? And, and a lot of times, risk is what? It's taught. Right? It's learned behavior. Like what? Creativity? This creativity is is non-creative behavior taught? Right? We talked about that during leadership training. It's one of the things I brought forward. Creativity is actually taught. Risk, it's the same thing, right? If you are so risk adverse, are you creative? Are you open? Are you enabling will? Your will? Right? The answer is no, right? We must be that, I think. And we have to think about our people and our partnerships overall. Adapt, you know, I'm going to go back before I skip that. I want to go back to one regulation. With driverless vehicles, right, lots of change, right? Everything in 321 changes. Everything in code changes, right? There's already been a lot of discussion in, uh, especially on the East Coast, that they're starting to see significant drops in OWIs because of Uber, right? It's pretty convenient. It cost me about six bucks. Six dollars versus a thousand. I'm in jail. Hmm. I'm going to go with the six dollars and leave my car downtown and take Uber back, right? So does that have an impact? on a community's budget? A little bit? I would say so, right? So uh, would driverless vehicles have an impact on tickets, speeding, right? Is somebody gonna talk to Cedar Rapids about that? <laughs> I think something might happen, right? might blow even a bigger hole in their budget, right? Ouch. I'll let you guys talk to them. I think they're sick of talking to me. So, but that's a change, right? That, that's a, a major effect. It's a major effect on funding for a lot of communities, right? You know, sort of the, the old thing of, of you, know, you know, does the, does the government really want everybody to stop smoking? Yeah, no, because it would really cause huge problems in the budget, right? Yeah. So, but that is going to have a, a major league effect on regulation. Yeah, change it all. Everything goes out the window. And we have to enable that. That's my personal belief, right? In, in a lot of cases, and this is one that came up to me afterwards, which is true, I was going to mention this, is, is Uber being embraced? No. City of Des Moines, yeah. When I was in, right before I got to France, you know, they, the taxi drivers were burning the Uber cars in Paris. I'm not joking. Yeah, it's crazy. I had a guy, one of the guys that I was over there traveling, he took Uber from the, the airport. I don't know how he did it, but he took Uber to the hotel, and the hotel person saw that it was not a taxi, it was an Uber. The hotel person, he said, came out and started yelling at the driver, and the driver took off. Right? And I keep thinking, I go back to that mobility as a service, I'm like, huh? That's mobility as a service, isn't it? Right? Only if it's a taxi, right? You see they put taxi in there all the time. I thought that was pretty interesting. So uh, I don't know if they want to enable that. Uh, but you can see Uber, though, right? Very clearly, do they need the driver? Why? Today. Do they need the driver 10 years from now? 
interesting model, right? Uh, they don't own vehicles. They don't have a driver. They develop the technology to essentially provide a vehicle to take you from point A to point B in a safe manner. Sounds pretty good, right? Sounds pretty profitable. Yes? Pretty interesting, I think, overall. OK, so let's go back to this last one, adaptability and collaboration. I want to talk about mapping, right? So I asked this this morning, let's see how good I am this time. Who has a state map on them right now? Yes, let me see it. Take it out. I knew it. There it is, right? Love that. Willie had one this morning. Nice, right? So mapping, is that map, who's that map for? Mitch, right? And Craig and Willie. Those are the only ones. <laughs> oh, he's got the bicycle map too. Okay. Everyone has a map. It's on your cell phone. It's for a person, right? It's for us. Is it active, dynamic, and living? No. Right? This is one of the, the big things from my personal the future of transportation is mapping for machines. Right? Vehicles are machines. Right? Well, all types of machines, right? is it actually has to be a living thing. Right? It has to be something that's constantly, because mapping is, is dynamic, because right? there's change on the system all the time. And so it has to have a very active, real process. Right? And uh, this is one area that I'm very interested in. I actually believe this is one of the ways to enable the future. I'm not trying to say what it is, the better mapping we have in the state, and we have some pretty phenomenal mapping relative to other states, I think we're way ahead. If we can, if we can push the envelope of mapping in our state, it actually enables all the things from, uh, from the future side of driverless vehicles and mobility and all those types of things because it becomes, it's a consumable thing. So the question is, who does the mapping? Is it our role? Always will be? I don't know, right? Or does it require collaboration and partnership? I believe much more collaboration and partnership than it has been in the past, right? We focus a lot on partnership and collaboration with contracting industry, right? There's no question about that. What if we focus on the same level of partnership and collaboration with mapping entities? I think it could have very transformative effects on the transportation system, not only for us, but for our customers, enabling different types of activities. Okay? Web and cloud-based customer interactions. Do we do that today? A little bit, right? What about all web and cloud-based customer interactions? Do we do that right now, tomorrow, <laughs> Jeff, next week? Next month, I have a sense of urgency, right? Do you see that as a future? My answer is yes, I actually do, right? So do our current architecture, our programs, will they fit in a web and cloud-based customer interaction system? Probably not, right? A lot of the systems we use, a lot of the processes we use, won't likely fit in that. Right? But I think we have to start talking about that, which is one of the things I actually believe we already are, by the way, <laughs> having this conversation. We're beginning it, right? A lot of people have participated in eVision, saying, really, where should we go? Do, does does uh, the art system allow web and cloud-based customer interactions? Does anybody know what the art system is? No. It's basically the system that handles driver's license vehicles, right? And it's not set up that way, right? It's set up for us to manage with a customer, right? Well, what if we don't want to manage it? And a web and cloud-based means anybody can have access to that system. So what's a big issue then? Security, right? Very important. Right? So at some point, does, does everybody have to come in to get the driver's license? 
Yes? No? Mixed bag there. Probably not, right? I know who the person is. We, can, we have all the identifying factors that we can work through. You don't need to overall, okay? Advanced analytics in real time. That goes with mapping for machines, right? You have to be able to do the calculation in real time. My belief is you can actually do it without having connectivity, meaning one vehicle talking to another vehicle and a vehicle talking to a traffic signal or you know, understanding all the things around it. I think you can actually do it through LTE, is my belief, through 5G. The latency actually goes away um, uh, overall. And so mapping for machines, active dynamic living, advanced <laughs> analytics in real time. So are we the ones going to be doing the advanced analytics? Probably not. Maybe enabling it, right? If we set this, this, the architecture correctly in a cloud-based system, that can happen, right? And it can push the analytic right to the vehicle, right to the person, right to their phone, right? And do the calculation right there. And help them make what the choice is they want. Help them think about what mobility is best for them. And lower the cost significantly overall. So if you think about especially these items, adaptability, collaboration, mapping for machines, one of the things that we've done, right, we're already on cutting edge in so many areas already, okay? And let's think of uh, uh, driverless vehicles, you know, connected vehicles. Very, very soon, right? Um, and I had, this is the conversation I had with a company called Here that, I'm, that I believe are going to come and work with us on, on mapping uh, the state, is, um, is thinking about what we already are doing, right? Mobile DL, right? We're one of the first, right? Do we, do we carry a driver's license so that we can tell somebody and show them that I know how to drive? Right? No, right? It's, it's about identity, right? It's a connectivity. So imagine now that... Obviously, then it requires less interaction because we know who the person is. We, we can verify who they are, right, through this, right, or some sort of wearable technology, okay, in the future. That also means that as I set up my phone, right, here's what I like it to look like. Here's what my screen looks like, right? So it means that as I approach a vehicle, the vehicle will know who I am. It knows how I like to ride, as I like to say. Not drive, how I like to ride. I'll get in the vehicle because it knows me. It knows where I want to go because I've already told it, right, through my phone and or some sort of technology. And, the, and the, 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 in the car will actually set up the way I like my screen, if that's the way it is. It'll constantly change right to that because it knows me and what I like. In addition, even if it's a connected vehicle, right, it can know that Paul Trebino tends to drive a little too fast on certain segments. It can know that he's had three accidents in the last six months, and maybe that we have to let that vehicle only go 50 on these types of roads rather than 55. Or I could say, you know, uh, I'm gonna, we're going to send a signal, and it's going to vibrate his chair on the left side of his leg to make sure that he knows he has to slow down on the upcoming curve. That is all on the cusp right now, okay? a point of no return, an event horizon. It is here right now. For some, for all of us, it may seem scary. Right? For some, it's like the greatest thing ever, right? From their perspective. And, but I believe that has very transformative effects on the agency overall. No question. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. We have to embrace that, right? and enable that, because I think in the end, customer is going to drive that. We are, and we're the customers. The expectation of what we want, and what we want out of our vehicle, has significantly transformed what vehicles look like, right? Uh, and what's in the vehicles, the technology in the vehicles, because customers are asking for that. They want that in the vehicle, okay? So, what I just talked about, challenging, yes, fun, yeah, I think so. It's spectacular. Interesting? Sure. Very. 
Or, potentially, never going to happen? Maybe, right? So, it's a broader horizon, I admit that, okay? But it also shows, I think, the things we're already doing that a lot of states, a lot of cities and counties are not doing, right? We're, we're definitely in the front row. We're in the driver's seat trying to enable that in the system, right? And a lot of that, most of that, as I like to say, all of that has to do with leaders like you. It's about your will, right? It's easy to say, no, I don't want to do that, or no. It's harder to say, will. Yeah, I'm going to will. We will do that. There is a way. We can find a way to do that. And that is more important than anything else, OK? All the technology and the other stuff is the will that will drive the transformative effect on, on transportation. OK. 11.20. I have 10 minutes. So who wants to comment or question or discuss? Yes, you have to. Otherwise, I won't let you go to lunch. Come on, yell it out. Let's go. Everybody was very engaging before. Come on. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I was just trying to describe the Who fact that... Uh, Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get up and do some calisthenics now. Um, the, uh, I was trying to say that, you know, the United States is such a huge landmass in comparison to the European landmass. Mm -hmm. Things are so much closer together if you're, if you're going someplace in the UK, uh, you know, United Kingdom, uh, you know, various places over there, yeah. France, whatever. So it kind of makes sense, I guess, that some of this stuff that, you know, driverless vehicles and, and call up your vehicle and have something arrive in 10, 15 minutes to come pick you up, take you where you want to go. That's, that's great, but I think that's, for the United States, I think it's kind of unrealistic, especially when you get to unpopulous areas like your description of Wyoming. Wyoming. Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't know how many people live in Wyoming. Sure, a lot 580,000, by the way. Really? Yes. So. Okay, so we're about, what, 3 million here in that state of Iowa? Yeah. Somewhere around there. Um, so I, I guess uh, driverless vehicles for me is not really that appealing because it's a form of independence that we've all got accustomed to Absolutely. over the years that we've had the ability to head down the road, go to a park, go to vacations, you know, drive wherever you want to go, get groceries, come to work, whatever, you know. Will that always stay the same? Well, I don't have a crystal ball on that. But, I don't uh, either. Right. I get, I agree with this, is that culturally we are different, right? That's the, the individualistic part of, of what, who we are as the United States, which is a positive thing, right, uh, in that same sense. But I also believe in that same uh, perspective that is that there's going to be shifts in that dynamic. And it's, some people say that's generational. I don't necessarily buy into that. Um, I think a lot of it driven from what we want and what we view as convenient uh, is different. And, and so, yes, I agree on landmass side, we are larger, it's not necessarily going to function. How are you going to do that in Alaska? But where there is density um, and where there's a metro area, I see it uh, uh, likely happening. And convenience has to do with a vehicle itself. Who owns the vehicle? That's the question, right? It, there, there is a belief that you know, ownership is going to shift away to some other entity, right? I don't believe that. I think there will always be a mixture uh, of ownership for a while, but what the vehicle does and how it how it moves and how it how it travels uh, uh, is not necessarily me with my feet on the pedals and my hands on the steering wheel. I believe that will change because it becomes uh, easier and simpler for me, it, which allows me to do other things. Right? It saves time in that sense. Uh, also, good good question. Good comment. Others. You gotta pass the mic. Somebody's gotta run. We'll do this one and then we'll come here. 
With the electronic driver's license, what yes. sort of acceptance have you had with travel? So I, uh, so for the, Melissa could probably answer this better than I could. We're, we actually had conversations with what, hy -Vee and what was the other one? There was one other one, wasn't there? I thought Mark mentioned two, but maybe it was just hy -Vee, so that they could start to accept it, because you can scan it, right? Um, on the travel side, there's, I think Paul's starting to do some reach out with uh, um, TSA. I used it, um, and uh, here's what happened. I walked up, uh, I was in Des Moines, and they asked, you know, you give them the, the boarding pass, which I actually had on my phone too. <laughs> and then I, I showed him the driver's license, and he goes, Supervisor! <laughs> like that. Just literally like that. I'm like, really? Really? Supervisor? You know, and they're like, oh, well, we're not, we've heard of that, but we're not ready to accept that. So what did, what did he want? He wanted me to take out my physical driver's license and show him, which actually has less protection, much less security and proof of who I was than, than we would advocate the digital. But it's coming. That's my belief, is that you're going to see a strong movement um, towards that uh, uh, overall. You know, on your phone right now, I was actually just doing it, you know, you can carry your passport, right? There's a, um, a mobile pass, it's called, mobile passport. It's accepted by the United States and Canada. So you can use a mobile version, which essentially is putting your passport in, you log it in, you can scan it in uh, uh, overall. But eventually, why does it have, why do we have to have two? or three, or four, or five. You are who you are, and if we allow that identity, you know, and you get to share it as you think is right. I want to share it with that vehicle that's pulling up, with that Uber driver who knows who I am. He's picking up Paul, and I know that's Stanley, or Susan, right? I mean, literally, that's what happens. I got in the car, I'm like, hey, Susan. She's like, hey, Paul. I'm like, yeah, going over here in Dallas, you know? That's a great interaction. That totally changes that perspective. It was convenient, and it was fast. So, question. Go ahead. Thank you. With the driverless vehicles that you're talking about, from what I've seen on the internet and on TV where they showed it, a lot of them are affected by like center line painting and edge line painting. Yes. Won't that affect the technology that we will have to get into? For our like our painting and everything and the, and how long it lasts. Yeah, so we're actually getting up. this question right now. So because I raised it, I've done it at a couple of meetings, and uh, so the Gazette's been calling. I talked to Brian Morelli recently, and this is the this is the trap game that the press plays, right? So they go, so uh, you guys got a lot more funding, and you're supposedly going to do this, uh, uh, you know, uh, connected corridor as we like to call it, or you know, to enable a potentially uh, automated connected fully automated uh, vehicles to travel, which is Cedar Rapids area, Iowa City. And, uh, and he's like, so, so we heard that, you know, talk to some of these companies and they need higher level paint markings. So is that an extra, is that like adding about 5% cost to all the projects, right? That's the trap, right? Because that's what they want to say, because then, I'll press here, I was actually just talking to Andrew about this, is that what he's gonna do is put it in our cloud, and, and they, I get along with the, the, uh, Brian really well, but it's, the controversy that, hey, $200 million more in funding, and, and they're spending an extra 5% on gadgets, right? Uh, connectivity and the signals and, and, and higher level paint markings. Do we really need that or do we need to fix bridges and, and fix pavements, right? That's what they're trying to do. And what I said to him is I don't view it as an extra cost. I actually view there is new technology coming out in pavement marking and reflectivity that likely can extend life and lower our costs that actually enables uh, driverless vehicles, connected vehicles, to read that uh, uh, pavement marking. And then the second piece is high definition mapping. This is the conversation we have going on with HERE, which I believe they're gonna come here. Uh, the company's called HERE. They're gonna come to our state and help us uh, uh, map the corridor, which is essentially to the centimeter or half a centimeter level. And so the two pieces, mapping for machines, right, and uh, visibility, help the vehicle, and you, you layer that over with 5G LTE and a few other things, and all of a sudden you enable the movement of those vehicles, right? Because they have, because at some point, our pavement markings get covered by snow, right? So, but depending on the connectivity, the vehicle's still may be able to, to know that it's right in the lane or it's not in the lane, even without 
uh, that protection. That's part of the piece that we feel has to be worked on in the future for them to be able to actually function. And we want to, in my perspective, is let's enable that. But that's a very careful thing. And this is one of the things I, I talk to a lot of people about. There's a big move in Michigan is doing DRSC, which is the digital, reliable, shortwave, whatever communication, where you're essentially the vehicle will have connected pieces, and it can talk to other vehicles, but it also can talk to a traffic signal or recognize you know, various pieces along the way. And there's an exchange. But that requires an investment in what is, as I would say, policymakers would tell me, gadgets, right? Oh, you're going to spend you know, a million dollars outfitting traffic signals with a bunch of gadgets so they can talk to three cars, because that's all we have in the state. That's what they would say, right? And, and my perspective is that is actually a shorter term. Uh, and I don't think it's worthwhile for our investment. Does it make sense for Michigan? The answer is uh, yeah, because they have the biggest car makers in the world all focused on that connected perspective, which is why they're developed. Their legislator would never say, don't spend, hey, don't spend all that money on gadgets that enables all those stupid car manufacturers we have in our state, because they would get killed, right? So it's just a different policy perspective. And I think in our sense, I want to focus on the end. I think it's important for us to say, what is the horizon? What's the event horizon of full, full automation, fully automated vehicles? What are the things that we can do and the advantage we have is in mapping. We already have it today. Distinct advantage over other states of how we already do map, how we already have LIDAR, how we already have a linear referencing system that I think enables us to get there much faster and actually sets the stage for us to move that, that event forward. Good question. Okay, 11.31, time for lunch, right? Thank you very much. <laughs>